cards even came, but this is a good one. We started our um, initial look at these subjects. What now? Uh, 14 weeks ago or something, we looked first at axial loading, and our I don't I don't even remember if we specifically stated it, but the uh, the objects being loaded, we were were relatively short in that their <coughs> length dimension was uh, not terribly bigger than their width dimensions. Um, I don't remember that we actually said it, but what that that if we did look at it more specifically, for uh, ductile materials under this kind of loading, they would tend to deform something like this. And we did look at that a bit when we looked at the, uh, uh, the different strains and the different directions with Poisson's ratio. So a ductile material would tend to uh, deform like that. A brittle material, like a, like a ceramic, like brick or concrete or the like, would tend to, uh, if, if pushed far enough, would tend to not really deform before it would finally just fracture and uh, have, have a, a catastrophic failure. Um, at least catastrophic, if nothing more, in terms of the part itself is no longer of use. What we're going to look at now is axial loadings where the length is much greater than the width and that the mode of failure is not necessarily uh, just one of uh, some kind of catastrophic destruction but more uh, quite possibly something where the piece buckles rather than just uh, uh, deforms it. Uh, in terms of whatever's on the end of it loading it in that way, it could be the same type of failure. If this was a column support for uh, a building or a deck, it could be that this slope there is enough to cause what would be termed a failure of the structure. Uh, maybe it doesn't come apart, and maybe once the load's reduced, everything returns to normal as it happens to happen with elastic solids. But it could be just this angle imposed on the structure is enough to cause uh, what would be considered failure of the structure. Um, you know, if it's your Aunt Martha sitting on the edge of that deck uh, at your wedding reception and she tumbles off the deck, you could consider that a failure because, well, first thing her lawyers are going to do is write you out of the will. So, you, you, even if it's just deformation there, we want to prevent it. So we're going to look now at loading and possible failures of columns. Our uh, target of concern is going to be what we'll term this critical load where that's the smallest possible load, or sorry, the greatest possible load we can put on and not go into failure, however that might be defined. Uh, we'll define it based upon the normal stresses in the material because that's one way we can quantify this as we look at just single m uh, members of a structure not looking at the tire structure, but it's certainly possible that uh, uh, even if the member itself doesn't fail, we can consider the structure itself as in failure. So we're going to look at, we're going to model this column to start with as a simply pinned two member linkage. So it's two pieces of equal length pinned together. Um, we need to allow the top to move up and down so we can imagine that. 
Something like that will suffice. That way, the top is free to move up and down uh, as part of the deformation, but uh, not free to move side to side. Because certainly you could imagine if you're uh, loading a long, skinny member and the top can go anywhere it wants, then the thing's just going to fall over. We don't even have any real loading on the piece. We just pushed it aside. So we've got to keep it so that it's uh, stable side to side, but free to move up and down. And then we'll apply some load to that and try to see uh, what we can estimate for its, its possible failure. So as it's loaded, then it'll deform something like this. Of course, this being an equilateral triangle, because the two pieces are of equal length. So, within the uh, limits of our ability to sketch these things, It'll deform something like that. Just like the last couple weeks, of concern to us is this amount of deflection from the neutral position. And just like we did with the beams earlier, we'll call that uh, a little v. Now, because these are elastic solids, there's a tendency of the solid to try to return itself to the neutral position which we don't have modeled here yet. So what we'll do is imagine that there's a spring that becomes depressed as, the, as our model for a column deforms and uh, it's that spring trying to restore things that allows us to, uh, to make a model of this business. So if uh, that was length L, and this is L over 2, we'll use this part of the deflection there as theta. Uh, remember, as usual, these pictures are grossly exaggerated just so we we'll, are able to see them. Um, they're much, uh, actually much, much smaller than this. Uh, the deflections and the length are much, much smaller. So, uh, let's see, let's label this point A. If we look at, if we look at a free body diagram of point A, we see something like, uh, oh, well, let me put a load back in there. Otherwise, we don't have anything going on here. So there's some load P there. Uh, <clears throat> this is a two-force member, but we don't, uh, uh, well, we will use that. So that puts that as uh, the load there. And that's, uh, that's what, P, P, well, let's see, let's, we'll, uh, we'll start, straighten it out in a second. Um, We've also got the spring restoring force there. And then, of course, there's load from the bottom leg as well. So we have a free body diagram there on the pieces. And uh, let's see, this, that component is equivalent to P. That angle is theta. Am I in the right one? Yeah, that's the right angle. Yeah, okay, yeah, we're okay. And so the horizontal balance here, this is then P tan theta. And we know then that the balance, the, the, 
the restoring force, the elasticity of the column itself that we're modeling with this spring must be 2p tan theta. Now we could also have modeled it as <coughs> not this uh, linear spring there. We could also have modeled it as having some kind of uh, torsional spring there that would try to return it to its normal. Um, it's just a, a matter of how, how uh, actually, <clears throat> how an author of a book wants to look at it, which way he thinks his students will see it the best. Ours happens to use the linear spring and not the torsional spring as the model. But the results in the end are going to be the same. So now we've got this, uh, this little bit of business there. We're going to have to use some of our uh, uh, very fair approximations such that um, that very, very, we're talking about very small angles here. So if measured in radians, then the angle is equal to the tangent of the angle itself. So we're going to be able to be, uh, be done with that. And that uh, V, the deflection, remember that's this piece there, the, the actual distance that the point was deflected will be approximately L over 2 theta. Uh, theta again in radians. That's just, uh, it's such a small angle that the arc length is essentially equal to the, the total displacement as it is. So we can put those together in the, uh, the general displacement. Remember our spring. Um, our spring uh, uh, formula, the spring force is uh, a spring constant times whatever the, the amount of deflection is. And so we can put those two together. We get uh, <coughs> we get then a formula that allows us to put all, put all the pieces together. To that point. Now we want that to be uh, less than or equal to the uh, actual force that we calculated would be the restoring force as it is, which is 2p theta. That's using the uh, both approximations there for um, small angles. Make sure everything's okay. Nope. Let's see. We want this, oh yeah, we want, we want the spring to be greater than that. If it's not greater than that, then we're going to lose, uh, then we lose our piece. So this is the restoring force of the spring. This is the force due to the load. We want the restoring force of the spring to be greater than the load, otherwise it'll fail. So this is restoring side, this is load side, so that makes sense now that we got it as greater than. Uh, if the load is greater than the restoring force, then it's going to fail. So we've then got a critical... Uh, a lower, uh, actually an upper limit on our load that we'll call P critical. Um, equal to something like K, L, let's see if two comes over, theta's cancel, we get K, L, over four as our design limit. Yeah, that's where we everything that looks okay. 
that's just the you know sort of the the turning point anything on either side of that if our restoring force is greater than our load then we have stability and if our restoring force is less than the load being applied, we have instability. In other words, the column cannot withstand those loads and it's going to continue to buckle farther. Uh, as it goes farther, it deflects more and sooner or later it either fails or uh, the restoring force becomes great enough so we're going to use that P critical to be our, our limit. And we want to find just what it can do. If it goes to any more than that, then we're going to lose, by whatever means, the integrity of the column. OK, so we've uh, gotten down to a pretty simple. Uh, you can imagine it depends upon the length of the solid. You've done this before too. Long uh, skinny things are much more wobbly than our short skinny things. We can even see that with my, uh, my audio visual aid. A short piece is much more stable than is a long piece. It takes much less to make this deflect. The veins aren't even sticking out of my neck when I do this one. But when I do this one to try to get it to flex as much, they're supposed to be looking at the veins in my neck now. You, know. you can see it's much more stable. Uh, even though they're the same material, same cross section, uh, it's much easier to make the long one deflect. So the greater the L, the lower uh, the, the, the uh, more we have to worry about it, as we'll see in a little bit. Okay, so let's continue our model. Um, we've now got uh, a way we can model the entire piece, not have to use that two bar linkage model again, where as we load this, now failure will come something like that. Uh, we want to model that now um, by putting these two things together. So we'll make an imaginary cut somewhere right in the middle and we know we've got We've got uh, loads like that, but those are offset and make a couple, a couple going that way. So we need moment, internal moment going the other way to, to counterbalance that moment that we have now. With, again, this being the deflection at center beam, center column of uh, V. Now we can put those two together just like we did in the last couple weeks because this is really no more than a beam in simple bending <coughs> and we know then that that moment is related to that uh, amount of bending uh, by uh, our, one of our bending formulas. And that's um, just what the spring needs to, to oppose. So that's got to equal minus uh, P, PV. That's, that's the, uh, the size of this couple. And it has to oppose that, so the minus sign. All right, we can 
we can rearrange things a little bit and you'll you'll like where this is going because it means that not all of the classes you take are useless to us so uh, we can rearrange this a little bit um, bringing over the PV dividing through by EI down to that. Which looks like what? It looks like a differential equation. Specifically a linear, yes. meaning the, uh, the coefficient terms are constant, second order differential equation. So most likely you all have it already solved in your head. You're taking DFQ or DFQ right now, aren't you? Yeah, so everybody's got it solved, I assume. Uh, I know that as an undergraduate, I would solve things that quickly uh, just by pretty, pretty much glancing at it. Yeah, yeah it's just, in, in fact, maybe I just don't even put up the solution. It's so quickly done. Anyway, uh, I don't know. I have to look up this stuff follow it along. So we've got uh, that then as our linear first order, sorry, second order differential equation with solutions of something like C1 sine <coughs> and lambda x. plus C2 cosine lambda x as, as a solution. Look fairly familiar? Um, how do we find out what C1 and C2 are? Boundary. Yeah, boundary conditions. Uh, some, some kind of known situation such as uh, when B, V equals zero, then we know that, uh, or I guess the other way around, at X equals zero, V equals zero, because then I wrote down the same thing. At X equals zero, we know V equals zero. That's the business of us having that upper end in a track. We also know that x equals L, uh, V equals zero again, because we've got the bottom pinned. Unfortunately, that leads to C1 equals C2 equals zero, which is a trivial solution. It just says that uh, there's no equation left. Um, so that's not a sufficient solution for us. So what we'll do is just keep C2 equal to zero, because that is certainly a solution, <clears throat> and then just solve on, uh, on the remainder part, which is simply another solution to these. It's not as if we're ignoring parts of the solution. So uh, this will give us then the solution um, the square root of P over EI uh, X, no L, yeah L. <coughs> Actually using the lower limit then that equals zero is now our solution. If uh, it's P over E I times L equals N 
pi. <coughs> That's the only way that we'll get a solution in here where the sine of that equals zero, which will also satisfy our second boundary condition. Doesn't matter then what C1 is, if the second term is zero, will be a sufficient solution. So that then translates to uh, in, in, in the type of formulism we use for uh, for uh, differential equations. Now that n is significant in that it gives us possible modes of failure. Our beam could fail simply like that. That's n equals 1. It could also fail like this, which would be n equals 2 and so on. This second mode of failure, we could guarantee if we fix the beam at a midpoint, uh, drawing's a little off a of midpoint, but if we fix the beam at midpoint so that it can't deflect side to side, then this is the more likely, in fact, uh, the first mode of failure isn't even possible if we fix it at the end. Uh, what also happens, though, because of that, is that the critical load for that failure is much greater in the second case, in fact, four times greater in the second case than it is in the first. Because solving for the critical load back here uh, at this point then gives us that. And we see that if n is greater, if n is greater, then our, our load goes up. Actually, it's n squared, isn't it? Which will give us the fourth that we need. Yeah, because we put the L over then we square, which will square the end. So if we have the second failure mode, then n equals 2, which gets squared, we go to a four times greater possible critical load. And you can see this in certain structures where as there are silver columns, they might actually pin them together with a, a stringer of some kind to help prevent the middle from deflecting. Um, <coughs> which then allows the uh, end to go up, allows then a greater critical load as a possibility there. So we'll use n equals 1 for most of what we're looking at here so that we find the uh, minimum load that could cause failure that way anything uh, uh, worse than that is of protection. Alright, so let's relate this now to the stresses that we're going to see in a deformed column like that. So the normal stresses I think our book actually will call them the critical stress because they're based upon the critical loads that we're determining here. Remember, that's the maximum load we can withstand and avoid failure. So now we'll relate it to the stresses. Was there a question? Yeah, would you use this for something like a foundational wall or a wall? Well, uh, not necessarily Solid for a wall. If, 
you you might want to do it if uh, if these are uh, uh, you know the more uh, no not not really uh, I'm thinking more of uh, just a, a timber a wall made out of wood that you <clears throat> the typical height of a wall is eight feet that's a long run without um, any support so uh, there are typically stringers put in um, in there uh, but if you pour concrete around these then they're not really columns anymore But the column, the column itself made out of concrete? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you could, except uh, concrete won't fail by buckling like this. Concrete will, will fail. Uh, uh, remember the, the uh, stress strain diagram for concrete was something like that, and then it just fails. It doesn't, it doesn't go through very much bending. All right, so we're going to set n equals to 1 since that's the mode of failure that supports the least critical load. Then we want to find the maximum critical load within that uh, constriction. So we're going to use the, the, <coughs> the limit here on the stresses is something like this. And then there might also be a factor of safety that we'll put in here too, which, will, which we actually will do. Okay. Oh, got the A. Yeah, good, because I need that right now. Since, uh, since I over A is uh, a, uh, it's purely a matter of the geometry of the cross section. And we've seen it before, not in this class, but we've seen this before in uh, uh, dynamics and physics one. Uh, our book gives it the symbol R, but we know it as the radius of gyration. In dynamics, we were using the uh, symbol small k. But purely geometry, which means if you're buying beams like uh, those those I beams in the back of the book, that will all be specified and uh, it'll probably be right in the table. And so we've got then uh, that I over A is uh, L squared. Yeah, L squared. No, no, not that. Yeah. Not the A, the L squared. Because what we'll do now is take that little piece there and define what's known as the slenderness ratio. We don't have any symbol for it, just, uh, just define it, um, defined as um, L over R, which, uh, as you get older, goes down. Because not only do you shrink as a person, you tend to fill out as a, as a, as a, as a person. So, on human beings, L over R is constantly increasing. Not in my case, though, of course. So we've got then pi squared over e no, times e times the inverse square of that slenderness ratio, which has no particular uh, symbol to it. <coughs> Something seems to be missing. 
So I have a back in here. Pi squared R or L times E. Oh, we're missing. No, I think that's okay. I don't see exactly where my extra part came in. Maybe we'll find it in a second in the notes. Is A just an area? Pardon me? Is that A just an area? Yeah, the cross sectional area. Isn't it in dynamics we can find it as race duration is I over a moment? This is um, uh, area, first moment of area that we're using, not, not necessarily first moment of mass like we use in, in uh, so the units different dynamics. Uh, for I? I don't even know what that is. No. No, there's still units. Uh, well, yeah, they would be because there's mass moment of inertia. This is area moment of inertia. Okay. In dynamics, we use mass moment of inertia. Uh, and a, actually a mass radius of gyration because of that. So they're similar, not exactly the same. If you remember, uh, it was we first used it like that, but if the, the uh, density is constant and the thickness is constant, then you get to what we had in uh, statics, which is a first moment of area. Um, but that's with constant density and uh, constant thickness. So they're related, but not, not uh, interchangeable directly. And so our uh, stress as a function of this slenderness ratio is known as Euler's buckling equation. And it's going to look like something like that since it's 1 over the inverse square. Okay, so let's, let's look at a little problem. All right, for maybe building a deck or something, it's very common that the columns are square, usually four by four, because that's what's available. But let's uh, determine uh, you can custom cut columns. They don't have to be four by fours. It's just a lot cheaper when you go to Lowe's and get them. So we're going to look at the possibility of using square columns for a couple different loads. So for wood, Young's modulus is about 13 gigapascals. And we want to find <coughs> A, the dimension A, which is just the length of one side of a wood column such that we stay under a critical stress which we get from over here of 12 megapascals a factor of safety of 2.5, a column length of 2 meters, about 6 feet, and for two different types of, two different loads. A hundred kilonewtons or 200 kilonewtons. So we have everything we're given, uh, except we'll have to back out of it the area. And since we're assuming it's square, things get a, a bit simpler. 
as we step through it. Okay, we'll apply the factor of safety. Uh, we have to apply it somewhere. It's usually specified we'll apply it to the load. So we're going to design this for a critical load. We'll start with the first 100 kilonewtons times the 2.5. So we're going to design it for a critical load of 250 kilonewtons. That will over-design it. We'll put in a lot more material in the uh, column to withstand the 250, expecting only 100 will be on it. So we could... Uh, solve for a critical um, moment of area from our equation and all of the pieces then are in there, pi squared and e. That'll give us a critical area and allow us to solve then for a. And then once we've got that then we check that against the allowable stress that was given. And determine if, uh, if it is below that limit. So once the work's done, all we have to do is uh, watch our units as usual. Because we've got all those pieces now. So you check that with, uh, with uh, a proper unit. <coughs> That should be in units of length to the fourth. So let's use meters. What? You okay? So we've got all those pieces. Don't remember, don't forget for a, a square shape like this, the moment of area is uh, 1 12th a to the 4th, and down here the area of course would be a squared. So we can solve for a critical moment of area, from that get the uh, length, proposed length of a side, double check it to make sure it's below the, the uh, limit of the allowed normal stress. Anybody want to have this with the right units in meters? Travis, you look like you have it. What? Is that that's not what I have. For eggs? Yeah, I have 7.8 times 10 to the, no, for, <coughs> for I here. Yeah, I got 7.014 times 10 to the What? That's what I have. Calculator is different than mine. What's up? Hey, you're up. Fellas, this is on tape. Which will probably make the five ten times better. Give you that win. <laughs> That's wrong. You got this down, Travis? Okay. What did you forget to square? I used a hundred thousand instead of two hundred fifty thousand for the other kilo. Oh, yeah. We're we're applying factor safety to the load.
Okay, from that you should get a a uh, a limit then. Actually, since we're, uh, we want to know the real normal stresses and check those, not the limit here. So this should actually be 100. Because if we put the 250 in there, we'd be putting a, a factor of safety in twice. Dimension A. Where is it? We don't have it here. Where it is zero, zero nine eight three four. Zero nine eight. Using this, and then backing A out of it, you got zero nine eight. Is that meters? Whatever. <laughs> so you might specify a hundred millimeters instead of uh, 98, no that's not millimeters, that's meters. Yeah. We'd be using spaghetti if that was millimeters. <laughs> not walking out here today. Yeah. It's terrible when it rains. I'll see you for now. Okay, so maybe 100 millimeters makes this uh, calculation real easy. Comes out something like about 10 megapascals which is below the 12. So you use the, uh, I thought you were using the factor of safety. It's, yeah, it's already been applied. If we apply it again here, then we've applied it twice. All right, so you guys, uh, well, I don't, I don't guess we need to, well, you, I guess you could. Double check it for the 200 kilonewton load. Just to see what happens when it doesn't quite work right. So just redo it for the, the 200 kilonewton load. Force goes up a little bit. <clears throat> We're going to need greater moment of area to withstand that. So A goes up, and then uh, see what happens to the stresses, whether they they uh, go up too much or not enough. The load's increased, but we're also increasing the area, so it might still be okay. This one's 
easy. That just doubles. So we're getting 15.6 times 10 to the minus 3 meters to the fourth. That should give a, a dimension on the side of, anybody happen to have it? Yeah, 117 millimeters, something like that. Uh, you, you, of course, can't buy custom-made wood with SI dimensions in America. You, you're going to have to buy this wood from Europe. Because, uh, yeah. Yeah. Earl can handle it. Earl and Ace Hardware can handle anything we send them. So you should get 14.6, I think that's what you said, John, anyway. And that's greater than the 12, so uh, this, if we really do need the 200 kilonewton limit, um, we're going to have to design it based on the critical stresses rather than the, uh, the critical buckling. It's close enough, though. It'll be gone by the time it happens. <laughs> nope. Because you build these in the summer, and that's when your mother in law is in town. <laughs> Sorry, Nana, just kidding. I know she's watching it. Okay, uh, for the picture of what we have going on here. picture of what we have going on here is uh, we have that Euler's buckling equation. That's just the, uh, the equation we came up for the stresses a little bit earlier. But now we're designing for a particular limit. And we can't go above that. That's, that's essentially what we're doing now. We want to stay below that critical um, limit. Stay somewhere down on the buckling curve, somewhere down there. All right. Okay with that one? David, you're happy with that? All right. That's for square uh, timbers. and. Part of the reason square timbers are used for posts most commonly is because there is a bias in the uh, orientation of the uh, solid itself. If you use a, a column like this, this kind of column is much more likely to buckle with respect to uh, this axis. Let me double check just what our both column is. calls that the y-axis, yeah, than it is with respect to the x uh, dimension. And you know that, too, from the very same <coughs> demonstration piece. Uh, as I push down on this, it's much more likely to bend uh, perpendicular to uh, the smallest dimension than it is, can't even make it bend. I uh, can a little bit, not easily. This way, it buckles very easily. And that's because of the uh, aspect ratio of the cross section is much different. So square columns are probably most commonly used because they can be put in in any one of the two orientations possible without concern uh, of uh, which way they might buckle. I noticed they were doing that on the uh, new wing of Williams Falls National on South Street. Doing what? They Using had timbers? Support, the, no, they had support. They were in steel, but the support columns were square. The, the columns were square? Yeah, well, they were using the support of the building burning. Uh, yeah, well, uh, whatever, one, gives a sufficient yeah. moment of area, two, is economical enough to use and Three pro are those going to be exposed? No, but they were interior beams. Yeah, 
Okay. Sometimes, because uh, uh, a, a square beam might look better than does a, an eye beam if exposed. Uh, it depends. For, and if, it's, if you're doing it in a brew pub, you want all that stuff out because it just looks cooler. So we'll uh, we'll investigate the possibility now with a beam like this. Oh, there's the, there's the dimensions I'm looking for. So this will be two inches down here, four inches up there. We'll use Douglas fir as a Young's modulus of about 1.9 times 10 to the sixth psi. Good thing it's in psi. We'd hate to have to use wood that has values and. You know, the wood we grow in America doesn't come in SI units. Uh, Lowable stress of 3.78 times 10 to the third psi. Five foot long. I guess five foot high is the better term for a column like this. Okay, and uh, oh, a factor of safety on allowable load of 1.5. So once we've figured out the load, put in a factor of safety. That way you can have one and a half mothers-in-law on the deck. All right, so. Find slenderness ratio, this L over R, and then find the allowable load once we've determined that. Now the concern is that it's more likely to buckle in one direction than the other. Now experience tells us which it is, but it uh, doesn't mean it's not something that we can double check. IXX, that's the one we've been using mostly, which uh, is the 112BH cubed, where B is the 2 inches and H is the 4 inches. Now remember, we're not necessarily using that number, we have the uh, uh, radius of gyration as the piece down here. So uh, we've got to determine what the radius of gyration is. And then need to do the same thing in the y direction just to double check this. We know from experience uh, which one to worry about in particular, but double check it anyway. Make sure it gives us what we expect it to give us. H over the square root of 12. And that reduces to B over the square root of 
square root of 12. So it tells you right there which one's the, the, the lesser. And then once we've got that, we can design for the critical load. It's obviously, uh, uh, hopefully it's obvious that we're going to need to use YY there as the uh, as the critical radius of gyration. So that will give us a pre, uh, a critical load, and then the allowable load is that times our factor C. So we would expect this fail at one place. Uh, we'll put even greater limits on that. If we get it right, we want to reduce that. Why are we using a smaller radius of gyration? Because it's more likely to fail in that direction. That, that lowers our critical load. If we design it with the greater one, we'll have a higher critical load. If we use that, then it could be over what the lower critical load is. It does get uh, a bit confusing when we have these two things going on at once. Sometimes we want the greater in one place, sometimes we want the lesser. Remember, this is our, uh, our, our critical load is the upper limit. Below that, we uh, would expect to be fine. We have a critical load yet. You can check with somebody besides me. Come on, yeah, let's talk to somebody. David's got it. Slenderness ratio is five feet over that. I don't know why there's not a symbol for that. Slenderness ratio. 
ratio, of course, is unitless. So that's about 104. That okay so far? That's the easy part. Oops, oops, oops. One of those days. This is an A. Units wouldn't have worked out on that. Somebody else get for that. I have 13.9 kips. Yeah. And then we apply the factor of safety to that, reduce that by 1.5. Was pi squared d 
Oh. Pi squared E over LR squared. If you solve this for the critical stress, then you get the equation we have over there. Just multiply it by A. Uh, I just didn't take that extra step. And that's the, the one we have up there. Okay, you got it fixed finally? Squaring the eight on oh, John. John, 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 John. Maybe you and I could talk about the double difference term. <laughs> All right. Uh, slightly different but related problem. We can get started. Imagine using an I beam. For a column, <coughs> and we'll use our regular model. We'll modify this a little bit for more possibilities on uh, on Monday. But imagine this: what what we've got is the beam is stabilized at midpoint, which forces it into the second mode of failure. However, since it's an I-beam, it depends upon which way the I-beam is turned. So we're going to look at it as if, uh, if we're looking down, straight down at there, we can see the I-beam looks something like that. You'd be looking straight down it, and we would see these supports if we look down there. But they're all the way down at the midpoint. So it's oriented in that way, as opposed to it being an H-beam with two mid-supports. So it's supported that way. Which means in the plane pictured, possible mode of failure is the second mode. In the plane, the opposite plane, where those supports are in that direction, it's now more likely to fail in the first mode. And there's a different moment of area for the two directions. So we have to uh, make sure we've got that. So for this picture, we'll put Y in that direction. Wait, is that right? No, that's x. Yeah, because then this will be the xx direction that agrees with this one. And for it turned on its side, a 90 degree view, that'll be yy. Y. So we could actually put the hidden line of the flange, sorry, of the web as we see it there, if that helps a little bit. Okay, so we're looking right down the y-axis, right at the beam like that, so we're seeing the two knitted lines of the, of the flames there. So we have to investigate both of those modes of failure. This is, uh, all other things being equal, much less likely, because it will fail in this way first, but it's not a symmetric beam in the two directions, so we have to look at both of the possible modes of failure. So here's some of the other information you need for this. Steel beam, so we'll use 29 times 10 to the third KSI as Young's modulus. An allowable stress of 42 KSI, factor of safety 
on the buckling equation. Not too big a deal. We can we can uh, uh, we apply that then to the where's the other piece of it? Oh, the the type of beam it is. So once we find out the the, the uh, The normal stress, then we'll apply it to there, to apply it to Euler's buckling equation. Um, the other piece you need to know is this beam is a W8 by 24. Yeah, W8 by 24. Oh, also that it's 25 feet tall. So I think that's all the pieces then you need. So determine a, a uh, critical load based on the two possible failure modes. Using that particular beam. Because it's more likely to bend in one direction than the other. two very different moments of inertia. And they're right in the table. You don't have to actually calculate those. But they're, they're significantly different. And they're right there in the, the tables in the book. And they differ by a factor of about four, which is uh, surprising. But we're not... You know, remember these deformations are very small, so we're not used to seeing them in our practical experience, even imagining them. Okay, you'll find <coughs> in the book that one has a moment of inertia about that axis of 82.8 and about the other axis of 18.3. That's the uh, that's the concern for this mode. And for this mode, U I X X. So it bends in this direction, then we're looking at moments in that direction. Also, the effective length is half on that one, uh, but that's either putting in the n equals 2 or the, the half either way. All right, so that takes us to the end. We'll uh, look at that one uh, before Monday.